Hello, everybody. Come on. We're bringing sexy back on stage. Just two women at a big tech conference. Yes, thank you. Bye bye. Bye <laughs> Okay, so it is an honor to be sitting here with you today. Um, you have inspired so many women around the globe. You've inspired a lot of budding entrepreneurs like myself here. Um, so I want to thank you for being here today. And, um, and thank you for being sort of my mentor and advisor this past year with Birdies. Um, it's, it feels so good to know somebody who's done it and rocked it and killed it um, and to give me advice along the way. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you so much, and um, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know Tony, um, you might have seen her face last month on the front cover of Forbes. Um, Forbes um, talked about her as one of the um, richest, youngest self-made millionaires in the country. Um, and when you hear somebody describe you in that way, and you see your beautiful picture on the cover of Forbes, what does it feel like? Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge honor for me, but it's really weird because, you know, I've not changed since I sold my company as a person. Um, I'm the same person that I was. Um, I eat the same thing, I wear the same thing, I sleep on the same bed, and it's, it's, um, I've not changed as a person, but I think the perception of other people have changed about me. So speaking of perception of you, um, you grew up in Korea. Yes. You moved here at 13 without speaking any English. Mm -hmm. um, what was that transition like, going from no English, uh, culture shock, um, and being in the United States and making something of yourself? Yeah, so um, I, uh, I was 13 when, I, when my family moved to USA. And uh, when my mom told me that we we're gonna be moving to, to Los Angeles, I was like, yay, I get to eat as many bananas as I want to eat. Because back then in the 1980s, like banana was really expensive in Korea. So that was the only focus that I had. Um, so we came and uh, I was put in seventh grade and I did not speak any English. So I still have a little bit of an accent. Um, it's uh, when you come preteen and postteen is completely different on your language skill. When you're preteen, you're you kind of soak up a language, like you're like a sponge that speaks up that soaks up information. When you're postteen, you actually have to learn the language because you've already learned and fluent in one language. So I had to learn a whole new language. Um, and then there's that cultural difference as well. Um, I still have some, um, I still feel very uncomfortable when I receive compliments because in, I'm from Korea, because in Korean culture is when you accept a compliment, that's being very vain because you're acknowledging the, you're acknowledging the compliment, and so you're supposed to say no to a compliment. And I realized that that's not that's not accepted very well here in U.S. So there's a lot of things that I had to get used to. Um, and uh, but it was really interesting um, going through junior high school without speaking the the language because obviously um, you don't understand what the teacher's teaching you, or you, don't, you cannot understand the textbook. But what that makes a person do is have every single pore of your body open to your surroundings, because now you have to understand body language, and you have to understand people's voice of the tone. You're always on 100% alert to your 360 surrounding to understand. Um, and I think that's actually helped me uh, be a better entrepreneur that I am today because I'm very sensitive to all of my surroundings. And I almost ha feel like, sometimes I feel like I have eyes on back of my, my head. That must be your superpower um, and why you've been so successful. So um, in 1999, uh, you launched NYX Cosmetics, NYX. Um, many of you women might know it from um, Ulta Beauty and also from Target. 
Um, and you started it out of your 600 square foot showroom at the California Mart here, I think in Los Angeles, correct? Um, Cosmetics seems like a pretty crowded space to me. Even back then in 99, it seemed like a very crowded space. At 25 years old, what were you thinking launching a cosmetics company in such a crowded space? Or were you? Well, sometimes, you know, um, I call it young and stupid. Um, <laughs> and sometimes not knowing is the greatest gift that you could have for yourself, seriously. Um, but, you know, my mom always said, my mom's a great business person. She's given me so much great advice. And my mom's always said, there's enough fish in the water for everybody. And at the same time, if it's an industry where there is no competition, maybe you should look at the industry and why is there no competition? Is there no markup in the industry? Like, it's, do you know what I mean? Is there no demand in the industry? When there's a lot of competition in the industry, that means there's money to be made. And it's, you should appreciate it, and that should be celebrated, actually. And again, there's enough fish in the water for everybody. So if there's only one thing, you sell a better product at a better price than your competition, and you can always outbeat your comp competition. Great advice, thank you. Um, in the Forbes article uh, that you graced the front cover of, um, you talked about selling value. Yes. How should entrepreneurs here in the room today think about selling value, um, branding, product, quality? Yeah, so a lot of people misunderstand value as cheap. Va being, be, having value and being cheap is just completely different, right? Um, an item could cost you 99 cents, but it may be a terrible value if it only has a worth of 50 cents. An item could cost you $1,000, but it could be the best value if it has a worth of $2,000. And a lot of people, like, you do drink your own Kool-Aid, right? Um, and I make that mistake myself sometimes, too. So you really have to think of it, of your product, like, really, Take a step back and really look at your product and see, are you selling a product that has much more value than the price that you priced at? And that is value to me. So speaking of value, um, it, after about 15 years of running NYX, you sold your company at a very good value, not high value, good value, <laughs> strong value, um, for a reported $500 million two years ago in July of 2014. Um, from what I've gathered, the business was incredibly profitable. So why sell it? Um, you know, for two reasons. I think um, being a, you know, there's a couple of reasons because number one, we had to sell the company because I had investors in and when an investor uh, invest money in your company, they actually, they have an exit period of either five to seven years. So when I took an investment dollar and sold a small portion of my company, basically I've had, I had already committed to sell a company within the next five to seven years. So that's number one. And then number two is, um, as an entrepreneur, there's, I, I feel, I always feel like, like there's a limit to how big, you can grow your company, um, and there's like a seven-year itch, right? A seven-year itch happens to, to relationships, to business, like, because you and a business is a relationship, too. It happens to everybody. So I was, I was on the 14th year, so that's two sevens. <laughs> so, um, and I was literally married to the company. Um, I had basically no life. I was living out of luggage. I had two sets of luggage that I was constantly rotating out of. I had two sets of everything, including uh, curling out. If I bought anything, I bought two of, because one went to the luggage and one was, uh, one was home. And I just, I had lived this life for 14 years before I sold the company, and I actually came to a point, like almost like a breaking point, and I remember this day, it was in Poland in March. It was, and that year in Poland in March, was freezing, cold, snow. I had not seen sun in seven days. And I remember it was really beautiful. Like I see the news and it was really beautiful in Los Angeles. And I was like, why am I here? Like I want to come and visit Poland, but I want to visit Poland when I want to, maybe like in July or August when it's beautiful, not in middle of March. And I had, I was like, I was bundled up in so much clothes, and I was going to the secu airport security. I was like, I was taking off the hat, the glove, the muffler, jacket, sweater. I was like, I had it. I was like, I don't want to travel for work anymore. And uh, that's when I came back. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm ready. So, 
it so, happens. It, right. you're, it, like, your surrounding will tell you when it's ready, time to go. So it sounds like part of it was the seven year itch times two, but also there was the investor element and yes. the pressures of investors. Um, you know, I just launched my company less than a year ago, um, dabbling with do I raise, do I not raise? You've given me some pretty good advice on this, but what advice would you give other entrepreneurs here as they think about raising money and, and kind of having that gun to your head about selling and moving quickly? Um, raising capital is like double, double-edged sword, I think. Um, it's, I think nowadays, well, when I started my business in 1999, the environment was just completely different. Um, I don't think the word entrepreneur even it was even like fancy back then. It is very fancy right now. Um, before in 1999, there was no no one said entrepreneur. You're just a business owner. Um, but I feel like um, a lot of people, their business became raising capital. Like you're, they spend 60% of their time raising capital. And I, like I'm an old school person and everybody has their own business and the way they, they run their business. But how I run my business is very old school. And uh, I don't want to spend 60% of my time raising capital. Um, and then when you sell your company in the early stage, the most expensive thing that you have are your shares, seriously. Because you have to sell it so cheap and then later you realize how much money Money that is, um, and uh, because even my investors, I took ten million dollars from them, and then I paid them ninety million dollars, and that's when I realized I was like, oh my god, this is so much money, you know. So, um, but so just realize how expensive it can be. It can cost you later. So, you know, I, I, I like I'm the type who wants to focus more on. Um, uh, uh, you know, being very cautious of spending rather than just go out and raise capital. Great advice. So two years ago, you were 41. You sold your company to L'Oreal. Yes. Um, you're gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> you're suddenly rich and single. <laughs> um, what was, the, what was the first thing you did? I mean, did you just go and decide, maybe I'm gonna buy an island and throw a big party and just retire? Like, what, what does that even feel like? I have no clue. <laughs> well, so when I retired, that was, my, that was my goal. Like, I wanted to, I sold a company and I wanted to retire because I wanted to go and like drink margarita by the beach and like take some time off. But the day I sold a business, I thought I was gonna go and pop some champagne and party and stuff like that. But I ended up going home and I, I slept 13 hours straight, not waking up. I felt like a balloon that was popped like in, like na in nanosecond. And uh, um, I woke up the next day and I got, I got a little confused. I almost got up to get ready to go to work. And then I realized that I have no work to go to. And actually for the next three months, I was clinically depressed because when you own a company for 15 years and you were like literally married to the company, seriously, like you have a separation anxiety. And no one told me about the separation anxiety that I would have after I sold my company. So I went through the separation anxiety and uh, I, was, I was depressed. Um, I was seeing, uh, I had to see a psychiatrist actually, um, and I was mad. I don't know, I couldn't, I, like, I didn't know why I was mad, but I was just so mad. And uh, um, I felt very, I felt useless. I felt that I was not adding any value, and I felt like I felt only a half a person. And every morning I would wake up and I would ask myself, what do I do today? When you ha don't have a work to go back to, your vacations are not enjoyable and your vacations are no longer a vacation. It's just a day on the beach and the sun's scorching on you. And the only thing you wanna do is find a shade to hide away from the sun. So when I realized all of this, I, so I sold my company to find the balance, right? Everybody talk about their work-life balance these days, but what I realized is that um, everybody's different and my balance is with it, inside my work, that's when I start, decided that I was gonna start another company. 
So you started another company. Okay. Yes, I did. So um, about a year ago, you launched your second company called Perverse Sunglasses. Um, if you haven't heard of them, check them out. They're amazing. Um, and what have you learned in your 14 years with NYX that you've applied now to Perverse? I mean, it's a completely different space. I know you have a non-compete in the cosmetics business, so you couldn't jump back into something you knew. Um, why sunglasses? That seems like a monopoly um, that you're going after. Um, and what have you learned that now is going to make you that much better? And also, what have you learned that now you're even more scared of? Maybe access to too much of your own capital. What are the, what are the fears and what are the opportunities now? Well, here's the thing. I learned that I learned nothing in 14 years, literally. Um, uh, so I started the second company, the sunglass company. So the, I'll, I'll talk about like why I started the company first. Um, so I, I look for business where I could sell product to women. Uh, women are the ultimate consumers, and I want to sell product that I could sell to women. I look for a space where there is a high markup, because if you don't have a high markup, then you cannot spend, you don't have the marketing power, and you cannot grow your brand. And then I look for a space where there is no, exp I, I, there's no, no expiration, or you have a really long shelf life. And you have to have a passion for what you do. So I listed the items of products that, that I have passion for. For instance, food, fashion, shoes, uh, stuff like that. And then sunglass was one of it. And then I started to cross out. Um, food wasn't good for me because it's perishable. And then if I make one, it's, it has a very slim markup. If I make one wrong move, I'll be out of the business. Fashion, two cycles way too fast. Shoes, too bulky too much warehouse space. And sunglass was just perfect because I sell to women, it has a high markup, um, it has no, sh it has a for forever shelf life almost because it's plastic. And what is a $36 billion industry that is growing at 9% per year and it is projected to be $54 million industry in the next five years. And there is one giant who owns 86% of this market. Like. There, I don't think there is an industry where one company owns 86% of the market share. And I personally love and have passion for sunglasses. So I started to, so I decided to start this company. And I thought, okay, so I'm gonna fund it myself. And because I have all this experience from starting a cosmetic company and running it and successfully selling it, it's going to be so easy. And then, oh boy, am I wrong. <laughs> like these days, I'm just like, somebody give me a hammer so I could smash my head, literally. <laughs> but, um, but I'm happy. Do it, like, I don't know if it makes sense. Like, I am super stressed these days, but I'm super happy at the same time. Um, it's a, so what I learned is this. Just because you have experience from one industry, it doesn't translate to another industry, although it may look like it's, a, it's in the same fashion space. And the same marketing tools that you use in your previous business is very hard to replicate in your second business because the time has changed. For instance, NYX Cosmetic, we, we were a huge um, uh, uh, influencer-driven brand, like Instagram, YouTube, and all of that. And we're always so proud of being everything being 100% um, organic. Like, it was never um, company-generated contents. It was all user-generated contents. Um, and you think, and so we all know this, right? So social media, um, when we use social media with my last company, the word social media did not even exist. And that's why it was organic because none of the influencers being paid. But these days, as you know, um, you cannot find an influ influencer with a decent following that would do a post for you at no charge. So basically social media became mainstream media. So now you have to look for a different outlet, which I have not found yet. I hope that is going, that I hope I'm gonna find it pretty soon. Um, so uh, short answer to that is, I learned nothing. <laughs> and enjoy the journey. It's not about the yes, destination. But what I, but one thing that I did learn is um, uh, just enjoy every day and have fun at what you do and nothing matters. And uh, the only thing that I have, same as my last company is, same thing, have fun every day, make every day a productive day, do the best you can, and then some more, and money, the financial reward is just byproduct. 
Okay, last question. Last question before we move, it, move into the lightning round. Um, so Perverse is all about high quality sunglasses um, at an affordable price, um, which you guys are killing it. Um, but you also have another arm to your company. It's the charitable arm of it. Um, you recently launched um, the Icon Initiative, which gives back 100% of the sales of an exclusive line of your sunglasses back to charity. What inspired you to do this and why 100%? I think companies do 10%, 20%. Why 100%? Yeah, um, because you know when I started the second company, like my real, like my my main focus was to uh, really have fun from work every day and to give back as much as I can because I feel like I've already made my first round and I don't need to really financially gain anything from the second round. So I really, really, really do want to give back, and I said, okay, how could I give back? Let me start a program where I just donate a hundred percent to charities, um, and it's not 100% profit, it's 100% revenue, not revenue, the gross revenue, um, which I don't think any company's ever done this before. And then it's not 100% revenue of charity of our choice, it's 100% revenue of charity of our partner's choice. So we just basically write a check, and that's, that's it. And the reason I, I did this is because I want to inspire other companies to give more, right? So look what Tom Shoes has done. When Tom Shoes came out, like buy a pair, give a pair, it was sensational, right? And, but it's inspired so many other companies to buy one, plant a tree, uh, buy a, uh, I have a Joe Huff, he's my friend, and you know, you buy Huff's product and then it's, you get to uh, give a hearing aid buy one product and you give a hearing aid. So, you know, um, it echoes through society and I'm just hoping that by my company making this sort of a move, even on a smaller scale, um, hoping that large co corporations, of course, they're, I'm not expecting anybody to give 100%, but if they were giving 10%, maybe they'll be more inclined to give 15% or 20%. Maybe there will be more companies that will, who will be inclined to give 50%. It would, it's just gonna inspire more companies to give more than what they're giving right now. So that's why I wanted to start this program. So if you look at your table right now, there's this sunglass on your table. It's a blue pair of sunglasses, and this color is called um, uh, UNICEF blue. And the reason is because our partner, these are called the Lucy Meyer sunglasses, and the reason is because Lucy Meyer, is, she's a 17-year-old young lady. Um, she was born with cerebral palsy because she didn't have oxygen for five seconds at birth, but instead of just living her life as a disabled person, she decided that she's gonna kick ass and and she became two times Olympic specialist, uh, no, uh, two time gold medalist for Special Olympics uh, swimming team. And uh, she's also a global spokesperson for UNICEF for disabled children around the world. So every, t and these sunglasses are only $50. So every time, or Anybody who buys this pair of sunglasses right now is only $50 and 100% of your money will get go donated to support UNICEF's partnership with Special Olympic that donates money to um, help disabled children around the world. So I highly encourage everybody, every one of you guys to buy a pair today. Um, I have a team here right now um, that could take your credit card right now. Thank you. <laughs> They're ready to take your credit card. Beautiful, smart, and charitable. I mean, if you weren't so nice, I'd want to hate you. You are amazing. Okay, so let's move quickly into the lightning round. Um, I have not shared these questions with you. These are fast. You can't think too much. Okay, oh first question. The moment you knew Nyx would be successful. Uh, the, there was a moment where we launched an item. Um, it was two colors of eyeshadow. There was a purple color and a, um, a, a lime green color normally a color that they would not buy. But happened to be that summer, purple, purple eyeshadow and lime green eyeshadow just happened to be the most hottest fashionable eyeshadow and like the, all the magazines were plastered. And what happened was because no one else carried purple and green eyeshadows, my distributors were actually coming to me with cash up front asking me, asking me if I would sell them my entire next container. So. That's when I went, oh my God, I'm onto something. That's amazing. When was the moment you thought that Nyx could fail for good? 
uh, there was about 2006, there was a moment where companies stopped growing. So prior to 2006, we we're growing double digit each year. And um, I just thought that it was that was going to be the way forever. But at so, so one point, we just stopped growing and we became stagnant. Um, and I remember I had $800,000 in my bank account. And what I did was I decided that I'm going to blow it all. So. I took out all $800,000 and I bought bus tail and I bought um, uh, those, those billboard signs um, in the market that I wanted to target. And then the market that I was targeting in 2006 was actually, um, uh, I was heavily targeting the Hispanic market. So um, I just blew through it all and I just kind of pray for the best. <laughs> wow. Okay, best word to describe you. Um, God, uh, just me. Love it. Uh, the next product you couldn't live without. Next product? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's an item called Soft Matte Lip Cream. Um, it's a combination. It's a hybrid of a lipstick and a lip gloss, and it's it stays on forever. It's really creamy. It doesn't dry your lips. It's the best product ever, ever on this planet. Favorite pair of uh, perverse sunglasses that you can't live without. Yes. Uh, how about these? <laughs> only $50. There's only 50 sure. pairs here today, and I highly encourage every one of you guys to buy a pair today. Favorite person to follow on Instagram? Oh, God. There's a, uh, there's a makeup blogger. Her name is uh, her. She goes by the handle um, Makeup by Shayla. Um, she, her name is Shayla Mitchells, and like, I'm just obsessed with her. What a plug for her, cool. Um, a woman from history or current day who inspires you? Oh, this is so lame, but my mom. <laughs> I mean, you know, like if you hear this all the time, right? But really my mom, I mean, you know, my mom was 46 when she moved to US and she spoke no English. We only, she only had $3,000 in the pocket and she brought three teenage children over to start her life again and she made an amazing life for herself and her children. So like, how can she not inspire other people? Your favorite house slipper, think about it. Nice. Favorite house slipper. Oh, I think those are called birdies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, couple more. Uh, biggest mistake you see entrepreneurs make? Um, spending too much money. Really, uh, don't spend ro like a rock star unless you're a rock star. And even if you're a rock star, don't spend like a rock star. <laughs> What's the tougher business, makeup or sunglasses? What's the what? The tougher business. Oh, sunglass. <laughs> um, who is, who's the most inspiring entrepreneur you've met? Um, that I've met personally? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian Lee. I think he, he spoke here earlier okay. today. Yeah, he inspires me a lot. Like what he does is unbelievable. Okay, and last, any advice for budding entrepreneurs here today? Yeah, um, believe in yourself. You hear this all the time, but you can like, I mean, this you cannot like, uh, no one can say this enough. I mean, there's going to be challenges and it's going to be tough. Business is not for everybody because it is tough, right? So, you know, think about a role. I mean, there is never going to be a moment where you're gonna feel comfortable. And when you feel comfortable, you're in the wrong place. That's when you need to get out and do something else, right? So it's like a roller coaster. And just imagine the, the scariest roller coaster that you've been in, you've been on, and then like multiply that by a hundred, and that's like running a business. I always like remember we talked about it this before. So you may look at other companies and you may look at other entrepreneurs, other and what, you, you, like, you like admire them and you go, wow, right? But you have to realize that almost everybody is exactly like you and it's like it's a swan, like above the surface, you're, you look all graceful, but under the water, everybody's paddling. So, um, uh, you know, during your toughest days, just know that everybody else goes through the same could I say shit? <laughs> Same shit that you're going through. It happens to everybody and just suck it up and deal with it. Woo! All right. Thank you, Tony Coe. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Tony and Bianca.